government operations and it is Tuesday, April 7th. So um, committee on uh, yesterday, we listed a number of issues that had come up um, around the, um, the Wyndham County delegation had a meeting with Drew from rescue over the weekend and a number of issues came up from there and I, I put those together and sent them out and I hope everybody who is here today with us got a copy of those issues. They were uh, kind of listed in three categories, supplies, personnel, and funding. So I think that um, Drew, if you just want to give us just a little bit of um, uh, an intro here and then we'll go to the three um, categories and start looking at the suggestions and what we can do. You're on, I can't hear you. Are you talking? I have to unmute myself first. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the major issues that um, I was highlighting over the weekend and um, to persist are uh, funding and the you know, the funding shortfall due to uh, not only the preparation aspect of COVID, but the uh, drastic decline in the number of patients transported uh, by ambulance services and what we're anticipating to be a, a significant cash flow crisis uh, coming in the, the next several weeks uh, for especially the uh, nonprofit or the private services, not as much uh, of a concern for the municipal departments, but uh, certainly for the smaller um, nonprofit and the kind of the regional nonprofit models. The second component that we're looking um, is the, the staffing, not only for the immediate uh, COVID response, uh, though that is a concern and we had some how we might address those, but making sure that we have access to uh, education to help uh, for the void of, of personnel that um, we anticipate having directly following this um, kind of first phase of, of crisis response. So those were the major issues. Um, we also were looking at having difficulty in getting PPE for service providers and first responders. And the, the other issue was uh, loss of personnel due to uh, National Guard deployment. And it seems like some of those issues have actually since maybe resolved or partially resolved since our discussion on uh, Sunday. So I'm thankful that we've already seen um, kind of some relief in some of those areas. So it might be helpful if you would tell us which areas seem to have resolved themselves so we don't have to um, go over them again if they if they really have resolved themselves. Does that make sense, committee? Yes. yes. So it sounds like uh, the string of emails uh, today that uh, EMS personnel that um, are currently on active duty orders will be returned to their, their EMS units, which should solve um, that problem. And we're very thankful and appreciate that, um, especially here locally. And word that we got this morning from the EMS office was that they are, are, they do have access to PPE and should be able to supply ambulance service providers with a month of PPE uh, in the very near future. So it sounds like we've made some, some progress on, um, on that issue. The health uh, department. Yeah, yes, Allison. Uh, Drew, uh, with the personnel, with the National Guard, uh, EMS people coming back, to their uh, EMS squads or teams, uh, will they be being paid as National Guard members or are they coming back as uh, private citizens again? I mean- I assume based on the email string that they will be just coming back our ranks as first responders. I think we do have someone from National Guard on the line, um, but I, I do believe that coming back just as um, first responders. Yes, we have the Adjutant General here with us. Would you like to respond to that? 
Yes, ma'am. I, I sent that email to everybody earlier. Um, we've uh, been quite diligent in, in getting with our members and making sure that they are coordinating with their employers, first responders, uh, medical providers, you know, paramedics, anybody who is working in civilian practice, um, if their services are needed there, we, we don't um, bring them on orders. But we do defer to them coordinating with their employers. So that, that linkage has to be there. So we're counting on our members to be, you know, honest with us when they're telling us that they're not required as, as critical personnel. But if, okay. if any any providers have a need and, and that information is not accurate, just let us know and, and we will end the term of orders and put those folks back into civilian practice where we're probably better served having them anyway. Thank you. Um, while we're while we have you here with us and then um, you might have other things that you have to attend to. Is there one of the things that came up um, at our meeting on with the Wyndham County delegation was, was whether there was the ability for um, the guard to deploy people who are unemployed, um, who currently have lost their jobs because they had jobs in other areas that aren't considered essential to um, bolster up the um, EMS system by being drivers or other, other non-medical people. Is there that possibility? Uh, that that has some potential. We would have to uh, get that through a, a DLAN, a disaster land ticket. So if a uh, EMS service or hospital or any provider is looking for that type of support, that will go through the state EOC, ma'am. And then we would okay. be able to take a look at the ticket and source it appropriately. So that it would be up to the individual EMS um, services to ask for that. Yes, ma'am. So if it you know comes from a town manager or um, you know a mayor or select board, if that if there's a need within that community, a police chief, a fire chief, um, if that need is there, we would in essence triage that request through the state EOC. Um, we're kind of the last resort, so there may be other folks out there that can facilitate that. But we're here to support, and if um, that request comes through um, Director Borneman, uh, up to us. We will take a look at it. So you mentioned um, municipalities, but most of the um, ambulance services are not municipally run. They are private nonprofits that the municipalities contribute to. Could mm -hmm. the uh, nonprofit ambulance services also make the request to SEOC? I don't know the answer to that question, ma'am. That would be, I can check with my judge advocate general to see what any of the subtleties are with that. Um, and, and somebody within the Department of Public Safety uh, may actually have that answer. Commissioner Sherling might be able to help with that one. Okay, we'll find but that if out. If it gets to us, we, we, we take a look at everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll find that out. Thank you. Thank Are you, there any more questions for the Adjutant General before, um, <laughs> because I don't want him to have to sit here through our whole meeting if, if we don't need him. Although we are also happy to have you with us. <laughs> happy to be here, ma'am. Uh, Allison? Uh, it's good to hear your voice. Um, Greg, I'm just curious, uh, you, you have activated uh, everybody, but not everybody is sent out on detail yet. How many are actually deployed now? We are just a little bit over 200. Um, a majority of those between the Air and the Army National Guard, for instance, our, our civil engineering squadron um, with the fighter wing was uh, mobilized and placed on orders to help uh, stand up that 400 bed site um, at the uh, Champlain Valley Exposition. Great. That's nearing completion. And then we'll take a look. Um, we keep people on as long as we need them obviously sensitive to, to funding, um, but we're always here on standby so we can bring folks on uh, as needed and uh, based on, on the requests. Facts. Thank you. Any more questions for the Adjutant General? I'm sorry. Drew? Oh. I just want to say uh, thank you for the, the quick response and I will send out through our association a notice letting um, the ambulance services know that if they do need that additional staffing, that it may be available through a direct request through the SEOC, um, so that they have information. And I'll Perfect. check with um, Commissioner Sherling to make sure that how it would happen if it would go directly from the ambulance service or if it would be a town that would have to 
request it for the ambulance service. Any that more questions? Good, Thank you. Any more questions, committee? Thank you. Thank you so much. Have Thank you all. Be okay, safe. Be safe. Keep your members safe. Yes, ma'am. Take care. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, so let's go back to then where you were leaving off, Drew. So you are think you're getting PPEs about a supply a month's supply worth. Yeah, and I'd ask uh, Jim Finger uh, if he could just comment on that because he was the one that was kind of leading that discussion this morning, if that's okay with you. Yes, please. Jim? Hi there, this is Jim Finger. Uh, I talked to Dan just a little bit ago and he got more information back that says we're on the top of the queue, but the order they had coming in did not come in so that he can't say we'll get the 30 day supply now. Hello. Okay. Apparently so they don't know. Something. Meaning it just might come a little later or they don't know if it's coming at all or what's, what, what's the feeling you get from that? His email just said that we're on the top of the queue, that they had anticipated it coming, but it- Maybe that's not. them calling. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, this is changing by the minute. Okay, I, I get that. <laughs> okay, so you will, you're on the top of the list. So, okay, that's at least good news. So when they when it comes. That's what it so, sounds like when it comes. So we'll get some. Can I ask a question of a uh, different question about supplies? One of the things that you talked about was um, the decontamination materials for your ambulances and that what you're having to resort to tends to be a little corrosive. And so, um, a suggestion, Laura Sibelia was going to look into that through BDCC to see if there were any local people that could do it. But, and Allison Clarkson had a suggestion about the um, distilleries, if because the, they're making hand sanitizers, would that be an appropriate um, product? So, um, local distilleries are making alcohol. Um, we've, we've tried utilizing that. Um, Jim Finger actually found that some of our uh, school systems have available decontamination uh, type units. So uh, that's another resource that we're attempting to, to uh, borrow. So um, we're trying to get creative in some of these solutions, but um, as far as purchasing, um, the supply chain is still not uh, widely available for mm -hmm. decontamination you know, uh, supplies, but we are Again, working at coming up with creative solutions. I think Jim's find at a local school uh, was a huge resource that we didn't know was available. You might also, um, that's a great idea. You might also check local colleges that have closed down because they probably have, um, I know they a lot of them cleaned out their kitchens, but I doubt very much that they cleaned out their cleaning closets. All right, any questions on that one committee? I'm sorry. No. Or comments? Doesn't have to be a question. All right. So, is there more about um, supplies that we need to address? So, just to make you aware, um, so supplies, and this is not unique to EMS, this is uh, healthcare everywhere. Um, not only is it cleaning supplies and PPE, but we are also. Um, finding shortages on other things, IV mm -hmm. supplies, medications. Um, yeah. And there's nothing that, that we can do about that. Um, you know, meter dose inhalers being a uh, one of the concerns right now, but it is an ongoing uh, problem. And the way it's kind of manifesting in EMS is um, increased costs. So yeah. as, as we're attempting to buy, we're, we're paying unfortunately way more than we these supplies and in some cases um, once we run out we will be able to replenish those supplies and that goes for the hospitals and nursing homes and everybody else as well so it's just a it's part of this pandemic are you in the queue for those materials as well as um, the hospitals so i asked the health department to find out if any of that material is available through the national 
strategic stockpile. Uh, as of right now, none of that type of stuff has come in as part of a stockpile, but they were looking to see if any of the um, kind of the medical supplies are available um, kind of outside of the typical supply houses. So you have the Department of Health on top of that one looking for you? Uh, we've asked them to, and that was uh, last week. I haven't heard whether they've had any luck with that yet, but I will be following up with them. I believe Shayla is with us. Are you Shayla? I am here. Yes. Okay. Do, have you um, any more information about that? I have nothing about that, but I would not be the person to know that. So um, if Drew has put in a formal request, we have a full tracking system. We have hundreds and hundreds of requests coming in for all yeah. sorts of different things from all sorts of different providers. Is, would it be um, wise for, I'm thinking about the 80 different um, ambulance services that are out there approximately, um, would it be wise for them to make a request through the, um, whatever that uh, the advisory council is called rather than 80 separate um, requests or are you doing that already? Drew, I'm going to let you answer that. I, I don't know the answer to that. So right now, every individual service is making their own requests for um, for supplies and, and services. There's really no um, kind of EMS coordinated um, effort towards towards the supply or the uh, response planning. Is that something that would be helpful to the Department of Health so that they could deal with a large one and somehow you could see to the distribution instead of them dealing with 80 different requests. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause that's, that would make a lot more sense. I don't know if you have the wherewithal to be able to do that. So uh, I spoke to uh, Dan at length this morning and uh, some of the information that, that we've been getting from ambulance services across the state, uh, he was unaware of. Um, I know the health department has been, you know, very much engaged in, you know, other aspects of the response and some of the, the information that's been passed on to um, you know, areas of the um, EMS office have not necessarily gotten to his attention yet. So, you know, when we were speaking about things like uh, financial implications and just kind of how significant those might be as well as some of the, the personnel concerns. Um, that stuff had not actually reached him directly yet. So um, there, there seems to be at least a little bit of a lag in, in some of that communication, which is you know somewhat understandable considering what they're going through up there. But I think uh, we take a, a more active role in organizing EMS services and their needs and getting that message to the health department. Um, especially the smaller services, I think, are are struggling with being able to kind of get their needs out. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm talking to services about their um, staffing levels, and, and you know, we have some services right now that are are currently uh, borrowing personnel from neighboring departments because they've had enough people out sick that they can't serve their areas and the health department is currently unaware of that. So I think there's a breakdown in that, um, that kind of that preparation and planning somewhere. How do we solve that? I'm trying to solve that by gathering and providing information. Um, there's no formal system that I'm aware of. Uh, the fire service in, um, I know as part of the, the briefing has done a, uh, a survey, countywide survey on uh, staffing, on needs that they're including as part of the um, daily update that comes out of the SCOC. Um, I know here in Wyndham County on the fire side, um, the services are reporting to the dispatch center every day on staffing levels and challenges and that's coming out as a, a daily brief for all services so that they understand that, you know, and 
Dummerston Fire Department may have 10 people that are out sick. So uh, if there's a fire in their town, they automatically know that there's going to be a, a staffing issue and send more additional resources than they typically would. Um, I don't believe anything like that currently exists in um, in EMS. I don't know that we're actually querying services to find out, you know, where they are in the in the process of um, response, whether they're struggling, whether they're on the verge of of collapse. So, other than people reaching out to their neighbors, I don't know that we have much coordination going on. Allison. So, uh, I'll add to, in, hey, wait, in, Anthony, would you move your hand? Yeah. Oh, because I thought you were frozen and I was afraid I wasn't seeing you if you wanted to ask a question. No, I'm okay. just intensely concentrating. Okay, sorry. Allison, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. I, I um, love it. I love it when you intensely concentrate. It, this just this just goes to the need uh, for the the for mutual aid for for EMS. Uh, you know, both. I mean, it just strikes me that in this entire all these areas of need uh, on personnel, for example, that you aren't speaking with one voice for all eighty departments to the National Guard, for example, so that you can identify needs and speak broadly for the entire system the entire system with supplies and the entire system uh, with funding. It, it does strike me that that's one of the needs that we could help with or, you know, that, that is really um, it, being exposed as a major need in, at, at this period. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It does seem like it would be a lot easier if you could speak it with one voice, it'd be more powerful too. Yeah, I mean, Greg Knight can't have 80 different departments calling to ask for, you know, a potential unemployed, you know, National Guardsman who could come and be a driver. They, I mean, it needs to be one voice saying we need 10 people in 10 different communities doing whatever. It, 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 it's, it's too much of a patchwork for it to be effective, I, I think, in that regard. So does that does that bring us to the um, need for the mutual aid? Um, I mean, it's a, kind of the the other end of it, but it is the same issue. And how how we address that? And I realize that um, the Department of Health is so overwhelmed right now that asking them to put some kind of a system in place might be uh, a little um, beyond their ability, but. Um, when we talked about it before, uh, Senator Clarkson mentioned that the towns, or I guess it was Senator Bray that mentioned that the towns have a municipal aid, mutual aid kind of agreement between towns. And we wondered if that could be used as a, um, a template to start that and perhaps um, somebody from an EMS service could be contracted to work with VLCT around how to how to implement that. I, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. So please throw out ideas, everybody here. And it is that template is posted on our on our website for today on under the documents. Um Senator, this is Gwen Zakov. Can I Hi, just Gwen. talk about that really briefly? Hello. Yes, please. Um so that so that template was put together about four or five weeks ago, maybe a little bit more. It was brought to our attention. I guess it would have been February at this point from uh, Chittenden County um, uh, town managers mainly that were concerned that they didn't have mutual aid um, agreements for services outside public safety. So this actually kind of started from something that related to wastewater treatment operators and sort of making sure that they were able to cover each other in cases of having personnel shortages. So um, long story short, this, this, um, the template that we put together um, was written really broadly, really openly, really all encompassing to allow communities to uh, cut and paste and um, figure out the, uh, an appropriately sized agreement for their community. So it's, it's much bigger and much more robust than probably necessary nine times out of 10, but um, it's a starting point. So with that said, though, however, you know, just the way the laws and statutes and, you know, the, the, the corporate entities that exist, whether they be governmental or non-governmental, this is written under the umbrella that they're municipal incorporated entities, whether it be solid waste districts or 
you know, municipalities on their own. I am not so sure how much tweaking would need to be done to make it work for nonprofit entities. Um, that's a little bit above my pay grade, but um, that's sort of where, at least for the template that's in front of you, that's where that came from. Um, a, in, in the issue of bringing in nonprofits um, creates some just more confusion because the laws around both are very, very different. So I don't know how helpful that is, but at least that's where um, this whole mutual aid agreement sort of came in from um, discussions in the Senate Natural Resources Committee. So um, hopefully that at least helps explain that part of it. Well, and Gwen, Gwen uh, it's Allison. The request, we already had uh, their, their municipal mutual aid agreements, and then there are uh, fire department mutual aid agreements, and and many of those are nonprofits, aren't they? I mean, some of those are are independent and stand on their own, and and are not arms of the municipal government. Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, it's that's why it's written so broadly, and and, and I believe that you have to have basically legal counsel to basically make sure that everyone is taken care of at the end of it. These are generally things that can't be done sort of in a in a you know, a weekend. <laughs> um, and especially when you're talking about two separate types of corporate entities. So it would be, it, it would need bigger minds to look at the, the how they're put together and um, the heads of agencies, whether it's a town manager or a select board speaking on behalf of municipality or um, uh, a, someone who's running a nonprofit, they would both have to have both of their interests, both of their interests met, um, which becomes a little bit more confusing. Chris, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just, uh, hi Gwen, thank you for the uh, sample contract again, and which I was hoping might bootstrap something for someone working on it. The Is there, do you know, for nonprofits in the state of Vermont, sort of a VLCT counterpart, like the Vermont Association of Nonprofits yeah. that might be looking at this more broadly? Yeah, maybe the chair. I, I can't speak to that. Yes, there is. There's a, um, I can't remember the name of it, but I get their um, newsletter weekly or daily or something. Does anybody remember mean, what their name Do you mean is? the co common good? Yeah. Common good. Yeah. Yeah, common good. That's right. And, and, and they're the sort of nonprofit yeah. uh, voice. Right. So maybe More they already have counsel and I, with an eye on uh, EMS, they could help, you know, do the rewrite mm -hmm. that would tailor it to EMS needs. That's a, I, that's a great idea, Chris. I think that's a terrific idea. Sheila, and, would you, oh, excuse me. No, it's just, I'm trying to remember, it's Laura, De, you know, uh, Mark, um, Mark's wife, Lauren. De, Lauren Glenn Davidian. Lauren Glenn, I knew there was another thing before Davidian. Right. Thanks. Okay. We'll, um, oh, try. So Sheila, would you, oh, Drew, I'm sorry. That's Jim Finger. I just wanted to make sure you know that we have mutual aid in the ambulance services across the state. It's actually part of our license even. That's not the kind of mutual aid you're thinking. The fire departments go town to town to town. Yeah. It's like I care 12 communities. And now it takes me 30 minutes to get to the next ambulance service into their territory and 45 minutes to their site. We help them out all the time. The kind of mutual aid that we're talking about now for personnel, there's not enough in the whole state period to, in, on most times. So it, it's not that we don't have mutual aid. We do have mutual aid. We do it all the time. Now, that was the other finger. That was Drew's finger there, I saw. Drew? So yeah, and that's what I wanted to clarify was so for the kind of daily uh, operation of EMS, it is very common for ambulance services to respond and deal with surges in other people's area. Uh, when I brought this up, I was speaking specifically about the type of aid that would be needed if an area was um, either overrun with calls as a result of the pandemic or unable to um, respond to um, as a result of personnel shortages or um, people being sick. So in our, we don't have a Vermont plan for 
how to stand up an ambulance service in an area that their service failed. So, you know, hypothetically speaking, if um, we run out of funds here in Brattleboro, um, it's very straightforward at rescue. We close our doors and there's 15 towns without ambulance service. Um, there's not enough mutual aid um, anywhere to cover the, the call volume that we have in Brattleboro. And there is no plan uh, in place to provide us with uh, additional trucks, provide us with additional personnel. So the, the plan I was speaking of was more this uh, disaster planning aspect of if and when we have the surge of COVID patients and if and when uh, services are feeling that stress due to uh, people being sick or um, they financially collapse because of the, um, the financial issues. What does that look like? We don't have anything in place. There's no plan um, that would uh, address those needs for the community. So what's the solution there? Jeez. Anthony, are you? No, I just said, geez, I'm crow. It doesn't sound good. So what what do we need to do here? How, what kind of a plan do we need to put together and who needs to be part of putting it together? And Shayla, if you want to chime in too here, that would be helpful. Uh, hi, everyone. Shayla Luther from the health department. So um, I think there's a couple of things. One, I sent out a link. I know it's it's this is not a um, you know silver bullet of any type, but there is funding through Diva right now for all sorts of different providers who are suffering um, sort of basically because of the lack of loaded miles for EMS is, the base, is essentially what it would be. It's gonna be different for each provider type and each situation. So um, it's not like a set formula for how that money is handed out, um, but definitely encourage um, you know EMS providers to apply for that funding right now. Um, the health department, you know, is supportive of ensuring that EMS services do not go under. I mean, that would not serve the public good or public health. Um, and so we're definitely interested in finding creative ways during this crisis to ensure their continued viability um, and are, are working on that. We're also working, we have a couple of different ways right now up um, for those who are EM, EMTs and, and first responder folks who are in the sort of training pipeline oh, and good. are kind of like stuck in that pipeline. So there's a couple different ways that folks can get through that. Um, we're not ready right now um, to say that there it's there's a, you know, we're not ready to just do a fully online EMT license. We still feel pretty strongly that even in this circumstance, we need people to have some of that hands-on training and testing. And so um, <clears throat> while we're not ready to stand up any, an online EMT program that's all online that would um, happen right now, we are interested in doing at least the didactic part online so that once this crisis is at least less acute and we are in a place where we can bring people together and gather people again, um, that folks can have done some of that online training and then just need to do their hands-on um, pieces. So we are interested in, in exploring um, that further. Uh, Dan had some conversations with Maine. I guess they, they have something that they're looking at in that department as well. Um, and then I guess the last thing is again, this understanding. I mean, I think I don't, I'm not sure what would be better. And I can talk offline with Drew about whether it would be better to group everybody's needs together, or if it's more efficient to have it be individual. Uh, because I don't know how those shipments go out. If they go out regionally, then having it grouped is actually not going to be super helpful because it would go to a region, not to a service provider type. But I can, um, I can circle back with Drew on that. Brian, did you have a question? Well, I saw earlier today that the governor has now uh, submitted a request for federal disaster uh, help. And some of that was earmarked specifically for emergency operations, emergency medical care, uh, anything like, you know, actions taken to save lives. I'm just reading the press release. 
and it provides a 75% reimbursement to state and local governments and some uh, nonprofits. I don't know whether anyone knows whether that would be helpful in this uh, situation or not. Nolan, do you have any idea of that? I think no, Nolan I, is I don't. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I don't know anything about that. Okay, All right, this was Shayla again. So I think that that type of funding is, you know, that that exploring those types of funds is a really good place to, um, to look, um, in addition to some of the other federal funding that is or or will be coming in. Okay, so I, I don't want to, I want to um, follow up one thing on the personnel here and about the uh, people in the pipeline for training and then and then jump to um, funding. We Is there any plan or any ability to um, involve the ski patrol people because they are um, pretty well trained and they currently don't have any snow? Right. So <clears throat> that is um, a great question. So uh, right now, uh, ski, per, uh, ski patrol can apply for our first responder license. So not the EMT license, the one below that. Um, and normally they would have to take a test. What we're looking at doing right now is uh, providing them with a provisional license without the test for the duration of the crisis. Um, so then post-crisis, if they wanted to keep that first responder license, they would have to take the exam. Uh, so I know that EMS is looking at that at the health department right now um, to see if, if, if and how to, to roll that out. Um, but I think that they are trying to move forward on that process. Do you need any legislation to, to do that or can you just do that? We can just do that. Okay, can we encourage you to do that? I think they are actually like doing it. I think it's just a, it's a, it's a process update. Okay, so I guess what we need to do is get the word out to all the ski patrol people um, that they can, can get that provisional license. So we can do that through the Ski Association. I'm not sure if um, Jim Harrison is with us or not. Molly Mohar is. Oh, Molly. Oh, good. I didn't realize that. So um, Molly, how about that? Hi. Hi. Um, nice to see you. Um, yes, uh, I've been in contact with the presidents and general managers from all the ski areas, of course. Um, our ski patrollers are not currently working, but they obviously can be in touch with them. Uh, we did get um, a request from Dr. Chen from AHS already that came out uh, to us Sunday night, and I forwarded that along to the presidents and GMs um, to that out to their local patrollers. Many of the patrollers, as you would guess, are already engaged in the medical profession or um, are engaged with their local EMS, um, but we have encouraged them already to volunteer and I'm certainly um, ready and able to get any other communications out through the presidents and GMs to, uh, to get to those folks. Good, thank you. Anything else on that? Anybody have any comments or questions or Drew? I had also spoke with uh, Dan this morning about um, the allowance to allow uh, first responders to be the primary attendant uh, during the height of this pandemic. I don't know if that has gone anywhere, if Shayla has any information as to where that is in the discussion. Uh, <clears throat> they're still discussing that. That, I, that is more, they have not made a decision on that yet, um, but they are looking into whether that or not to do that. If they do do it, uh, just to be clear, it would be it would have to be still under a crisis scenario, so it couldn't, you know, couldn't become standard operating procedure even during the coronavirus crisis. It would have to be like a individual cases, but I think they are they are looking at that, Drew. What What do you mean individual cases as opposed to generally during the the corona? crisis? Like it sounds like they wouldn't want it to be that they only had first responders operating trucks like for months on end but like you know Thursday night they don't have an EMT and 
you've got a first responder going out, you know, in, in that kind of instance, allowing for that, but they, are, they have not made a decision on that yet. Is that helpful, Drew and Jim? So I think that it could be very helpful for um, services that are struggling to get um, any, um, you know, providers out on the road. Uh, there's a lot of uh, first responders that, you know, work with ambulance services that are typically, um, you know, driving, uh, providing care on the scene, but not typically primary uh, service. And if we could lift those restrictions, especially during the kind of the peak of the pandemic, I think it would open up a lot of resources that we currently don't have. I could look at the numbers, but I think we have uh, like two or 300 first responders in the state that would then be able to uh, be primary care attendants in ambulances if, if we were to open that up. Thank you. Allison? So Drew, it, it also sounded like uh, the National Guard, I mean, if you could again act as one voice and, and each day let the National Guard know if there was additional personnel need, like we need a driver, we need five drivers tonight, we, we're, we're down, whatever, that, that it sounds like they could be used in that capacity too. They could be deployed specifically to help in, in uh, you know, uh, in that kind of a fashion. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, we, uh, this is, the information I got today on the call is um, the most specific information that I've heard yet about uh, whether natural guard resources could support local EMS. And, you know, it sounds very favorable and I can, I will get the information out to services saying that they can request that from the SEOC. I know the other question that we've asked and uh, Ray Walker in the EMS office was supposed to be uh, looking into the availability of uh, MRC volunteers through um, the state volunteer website of people that be local and available to drive. And as soon as we get that information back from him, I'll get that out to all services as well. So, but, but again, I think it would be really hard for Greg Knight's office to be inundated with 70 different requests. I mean, it, it, it makes some sense to have the, all those request needs identified in the morning and funnel through one voice to the National Guard or to whomever is it would then be dispensing help in whether it's a, um, you know, no matter what it is. So, in in that case, what um, I heard from him is those requests all go to the state emergency operations, mm -hmm. oh, and they okay. would put a single request through to him. So it would be each individual community got it resource, and then combining them at the SCOC. Yeah, I wasn't clear on that. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that in this case, there is a system for um, requesting help and receiving it. And um, what the National Guard is saying is that in many cases, they are the last resort. And there's there are other, um, you know, folks who, who could be sent out by the State Operation Emergency Operations Center. Um, and so that that there is a system set up for that for all, again all different types of providers including EMS. So one of the things that um, we heard, and I don't know if this is still true or not, but um, one of our delegation is has listed himself in the um, I don't even know what it's called the governor's volunteer line what or core core whatever the it's called. Core. And we were told that EMS is not, um, does not have access to that. Is that still true? Or if it is, why? Does anybody know that? It doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense. Do, do we know if it's- Only Senator, I'm not sure what you're referencing, uh, but if, but I can, um, I can go back to the state. EOC and get you information on who has access to which resources. Okay, yeah, I don't, because um, one of our delegations said that he, well, he has listed himself as a volunteer, but he's never been called, but we were told that EMS did not have access to that, um, to requesting volunteers through that um, list. 
that the governor is keeping. Yeah, so, I, I'm, again, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I do know that the state emergency operations center has a method for each type of provider and each, you know, like how to get those resources to kind of all the different folks requesting them. And, and I think there are algorithms for that. I don't know what they are and I'm not sure if I can get them for you, but I will try. Some volunteers might just be willing to come in and decontaminate the insides of the ambulances. They don't have to. So yeah. anyway, Chris, Chris Campany, you had a. Just um, <clears throat> I have an email here from uh, the Vermont organization that organizations active in disaster from uh, Phil Coling with Sir Vermont and um, they, the VOAD met. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it just says, hi, VOAD partners. I'm sorry I couldn't attend yesterday's meeting. Many of you have seen that Governor Scott set up the Vermont.gov volunteer portal as a way to recruit Vermonters to the response effort. The response was tremendous and many needs are being filled, especially on the medical side. At the same time, there's a list of about 1,000 people who are unaffiliated who would love to help. If your organization needs some people, either with a specific skill set or on a, in a particular place, please let me know. Sir Vermont is the conduit from that list to nonprofits and organizations, and we would be happy to try and get you what you need uh, in service and stay healthy, Phil. So just sharing that communication. So it sounds like the list is getting, it, it sounds like this, uh, at least Sir Vermont is seeing it. Okay. Where did so that Drew, go? Sorry. Drew, I think that you were the one that said that you don't have access to, to that, or is that still true or? So I don't know where the email that we're just hearing came from. It's something that I've never had cross my desk and the other services that uh, asked the question have never seen. So uh, we, seem to be, we seem to be breaking down in our ability to communicate. If that exists, that's great. And if you could send it to me, I'll make sure it gets out to yep. all the services um, so they can use it. Chris, can you send, um, forward that to both Jim and Drew and they'll get it out to everybody? I, I don't have their emails addre email addresses. Can I forward it to Gail and she can send it out to the list? Okay, perfect. Is, is that okay, Gail? Um, okay. So yes, um, uh, Chris. It's just one person's experience, but this past weekend as a, uh, it's been, whatever, 17 years, something like that, since I had an active EMTB certification. But I thought, well, I could probably do something helpful. And so I went on that web portal from the governor's site to sign up in some way. And um, there's no, you can sign up for state, like, a, um, I, I don't have the proper name, they are the Medical Reserve Corps, I think it is. And it does, you don't end up seeing EMS services listed. You see state level Medical Reserve Corps groups. Like for me, it's Addison, Rutland County. Um, so uh, I was happy to go ahead and complete it, but I don't think that, um, it didn't seem as though it was designed to let me reconnect to the EMS uh, system. So maybe we can make a suggestion that they actually list the EMS system on there. Yeah, that would be great. I don't, I, I don't know who administers what, but it looks like it's uh, the Vermont version of a national program and registry. Oh. Well, maybe we can send a, a note to both Erica and um, maybe Kendall, because I'm not sure who's. Um, guys, this is Shayla again. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's where I was offering to explore that and get okay. that information back to you. Um, because again, I know that there is a system. I just don't know what that algorithm is. I do know that it is also regional and that's probably why it popped up like that. But again, I'll get you more information on that. Good. Thank you. And maybe when you get that information, if you, um, so that it doesn't take a long time. If you can just send it to, to Drew and Jim and um, send it to, well, send it to the committee also, that would be great. And, and may I ask Allison. if Chris, if Chris Campany would be kind enough uh, if, if, in sending that email, if Gail could send it to us, I'd be curious. I, I'd include that in my 
uh, uh, columns. I, I hadn't seen that uh, go Vermont dot gov or whatever it's called as a, a, a portal for volunteers. I somehow missed that. I'm surprised that any of us have missed anything. There's so little going on. <laughs> well, I, I. Yes, no, I've missed many, many things. Yes, Becca sent out a, a list to us asking us um, what our fears were professionally. And that was my biggest one was, I am afraid I'm missing things that I really should be on top of, so. Anyway, any more issues about personnel or are we kind of on the road? Do we, do we need any legislative solutions or are things beginning to um, work themselves out? Drew? Make sure that, the, um, that we have funding going forward to support yeah. you. Yeah, funding is the last yeah, issue. Yeah, funding. We're gonna we're gonna address funding now. Excellent. Okay. Um. So, um. So I just want to say that I can't see every. I can only see nine people on my screen. So when if somebody that I can't see, like Shayla, if you have a comment and you need to say something, please just interrupt. Other people can raise their hands, but if you're on the phone or I can't see you. Um, are, you on, just, are you on an iPad? Huh? Are you on your iPad? Yes. You just scroll you could, over, just swipe. You I can, know, so, I know, but there are people who are um, who aren't pictured, like <laughs> Betsy Ann and Molly, and Molly is there as just a little person. Now there she is again, and Shayla, Gwen, and Pat gotcha. Malone. Pat, do you have anything to say about um, personnel? Uh, the, the only thing I've been thinking about is uh, once the health department unsuspends education, gearing up so we could get people that are completing courses online um, to get them the uh, opportunities to, to take care of the skills parts of the course and the, and the preparation for the exam. So we're, we're working on some solutions for that. Okay. Any questions about that? Molly, are you, were you going to say something or? Uh, I just wanted to say that if somebody, the proper person wants to pass along the information about the provisional licenses to me, I'd be happy to send that out to the ski areas and get that out to folks. My, uh, my email is molly at fevermont.com. Hey Molly, I'll, I'll be sure to do that. This is Shayla. Great. Thanks, Shayla. Great. Okay, so let's move on to funding. Just the, now that we've taken care of the big issues, this, <laughs> just this little issue of funding. So I think um, my phone keeps ringing. Let's call her and pretty soon my um, message machine is gonna go on. So Chris, our question to you was, would they be eligible for FEMA? And is there a workaround on that? I'm going to see who this is. Take it away. Okay. Uh, so this is beyond my. Um, you have to mute yourself, Je Jeanette. There she goes. She did. There she goes. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, I, I am not an expert on this, but I forwarded it the, to Kim Canarici. She's the uh, Vermont State Public Assistance Officer at VEM. She's the expert. Uh, so I'd let her know that you guys were discussing this and she replied back to me and I'll forward this to Gail as well so she can forward it out to everyone. Um, so this is, uh, this is for the uh, uh, FEMA reimbursement for the pandemic. She says, yes, EMS are considered a nonprofit and could qualify for public assistance funding for COVID-19 emergency protective measures. The program would pay for only overtime labor hours, however, as well as equipment time and PPE purchased by proper procurement. I have more information see attached. So I will send that to uh, uh, Gail so she can send that out to everybody else. But uh, if you want the expert to talk about this, it'd be Kim Candorici with VEM. And, and Shayla might have, uh, and others might have insight 
too, as far as uh, how this has been applied. I will note that uh, I was contacted about this uh, by the Wyndham County Sheriff. Um, I don't know if uh, Department of Public Safety or who uh, would be the logical entity maybe to organize uh, information calls or webinars uh, with groups of folks, let's so say the EMSs or the county sheriffs or the, or the municipal police, but it might make sense uh, for that kind of thing to happen if it's not happened. I don't necessarily have visibility into, uh, you know, we, we're mainly working with the town, so I don't necessarily know what's been done for other, uh, other groups of uh, responders. Um, so that, that those kinds of things could be happening, and I'm just not aware of it. You mute, you're muted, Jeanette. You're still muted, Jeanette. <sighs> the bane I'm of her existence. Am I unmuted now? Finally. Yeah. You know, people good. have been trying to mute me for <laughs> years and they finally found a way. So Nolan, my question was, do you have any words of wisdom for us? And we know you have wisdom, but do you have any words for us? Or money, today? really we or want money. Money, money, yeah. money, money. Bag the words. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need words about money. Yes. Um, I guess all I would say is that, I mean, I think Shayla and uh, is that Chris down there uh, mm -hmm. uh, have sort of laid out a lot of the potential. I think we're, I think it's, I mean, it sounds like I, I've been working with uh, or listening to other healthcare providers and there's, talk, there's money talk, they've been talking about how the flow and workforce and other stuff, but I haven't heard anything about the, the impact on EMS till now. And it seems like there seems to be some questions about what is considered uh, essential, not essential, but whether they're going to get the, the any kind of federal funds or um, I think the answer is I can, I can continue to look into it. Um, what Shayla was talking about earlier, one of the things about Medicaid or DIVA, that seems like that would only be specific to Medicaid reimbursements, which I think is not a big piece of their business. Um, Nonetheless, it's probably something to look into. Um, I mean, I think um, I think this. I think it deserves further exploration. I don't have any answers now. I think it's a great question. I wish I had more wisdom to give. I'm sorry, I don't yet. Yet. Yeah. Okay. Shayla, do well, you? Oh, Allison. Well, I mean. Uh, they are all, I mean, many of them are their own little nonprofits, right? So in that capacity, they are eligible, I would think, Nolan, for some of the, some of these uh, forgivable loans, you know, conceivably, I don't know if particularly the bigger ones, if they were set up as a nonprofit business, they might be eligible for the PPP uh, loans. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, uh, um, I think they'd be eligible for the same things that any other nonprofit would be eligible for. I think what makes the industry weird, complicated is you have some that are private nonprofit, some that are municipal. Right. And going to have different access to different things because of that. Like municipalities may get access to that somehow, that $1.25 billion that's right. coming in. And that will go out to some forms of grants to municipalities and municipalities will in turn probably put some of that money to, towards their EMS. May or may not, it's unclear, some may and some may not. But when it comes to the nonprofits, the question is whether any of that municipal money will be used to give more money to the, 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 non, to the um, EMS providers that they contract with. And I don't know the answer to that. True. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The only thing I would say is, is that on that money, uh, I know that I know that uh, legislative leadership have had conversations and are uh, trying to figure out like what is the legislative role in that? What can we add intent language when it comes to the federal dollars? And I don't know the answer to that. I understand that my understanding is legislature will have some role on how that money is spent, but at the same time. 
there's, there's, I think there's a sense of allowing the administration to have flexibility so they continue to move fast. I think the dilemma that it runs into is the same dilemma that I'm hearing for other issues, whether it comes food shelves or designated agencies or nursing homes is the same thing about how are we getting the money out from that bigger grant to the different priorities. Um, the only answer I'd have on that is talk to the legislative leadership about your priorities, uh, figure out when we figure out what the legislative role is, this make this a priority. I, I don't have any other answers and, until we have a better sense of, you know, what the legislative role is in terms of getting that money out and other than potential oversight. And I think that the other committees are struggling with the same questions. Brian and then Drew. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to point out there's two sources of potential funding here. One of them is the CARES Act, which is at 2.2 trillion and Vermont's getting about, I can't remember the exact number, but a substantial amount of money. 1.25 billion. 1.25 billion. And then the second piece is this federal disaster declaration, which does call out EM, uh, EMS things. Nonprofits that would be eligible for reimbursement include nursing homes, laboratories, and uh, hospitals, emergency care facilities, and fire and rescue emergency services. So there's two different situations here. I don't know, Chris uh, from the uh, Wyndham Regional Commission called out specifically that there's probably gonna be earmarks for some of that funding, but it, maybe it's for personnel, maybe it's for something else, but maybe no one could at least look and see what the differences would be between the two potential funding sources, but I do think there's money there. Well, that's, I mean, I, I think you're right. I, I was talking about the, what I was just talking about was that CARES Act money. Yeah. And the answer is that, like I said, it depends on how it's dispersed. And I don't know how the money's gonna be dispersed. I don't know how decisions will be made um, and what the legislative role will be in that. Um, so, I mean, you're right. And I think there's still questions that haven't been answered. Yep. So with, I'm going to go to Drew, but yeah. I um, would ask a question about when Drew um, answered or has his question. Is, would it be better for the emergency, the ambulance services, the EMS system, to actually put together some kind of a coordinated package of funding needs and, uh, and put it forth that way instead of each one trying to figure out what they might need and and then we as legislators could actually support something like that if we saw it instead of 80 different um, places trying to compete for that money. So I'll go to Drew and then Anthony. You're muted, Drew. I think I, am I unmuted now? You're good. Nope, no, you're fine. You Okay, um, so when we were looking at the the kind of the financial needs of ambulance services, and I know a lot of services have already looked at and applied for uh, some of the federal uh, aid that exists, um, I think with every other business in the country applying. I know um, personally our applications have been in, but we don't know when that or if that funding um, will be available. Some of the, the Medicaid, um, I think you guys got an email this morning about some kind of uh, Medicaid prepayments that might be available. Um, I just think it's important to understand that ambulance services were on um, shaky the ground before uh, we into a pandemic. And the cash reserves of many of our services was not to start. So the concern that um, I have for our organization, the concern I have for, you know, people that have reached out to us are uh, relatively immediate. So we've lost, uh, in some cases, more than 50% of our transport volume over the last month. So based on the payment cycle, uh, that means that services right now, their bank accounts are not doing too bad because we're getting paid for those calls that we did, um, you know, six or seven weeks ago. Uh, but what we're going to see is a 50% or greater because uh, a lot of the patients we are going to see now are not being transported. So we don't get paid for those. 
So a 50% or greater drop, a sudden drop in our cash flow at the point in time where we anticipate the highest expenditures due to the COVID crisis. Um, as we look here to increase our staffing to maintain enough ambulances for what you know, everyone tells us is coming, we're looking at increasing our payroll at the same time where we're losing greater than 50% of our total um, uh, cash revenue. So it's, a, it's a, a pretty short timeline between now and when services are gonna be really struggling to, to cover their expenses. Then you have the, the second half of that, which is the long-term um, implication of the lost revenue and the increased um, so uh, there's a short term immediate need to make sure services have the money to pay their staff and buy supplies. And then there's a long term making sure that these services are on sound financial footing when this is over. Hey, Drew. Yeah. Could I ask a quick question, Senator, of Drew? Yes, please. Um, your payer mix, like how, how are you guys paid? Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, or through contract? Like what's the... When you, for in terms of like patient flow, what's your payer mix? So it varies um, obviously around the state depending on the community you're in. So in our area, about 30% Medicaid. Uh, we're about 40% Medicare. We have a few um, private, I'm sorry, private insurance, and the rest is uninsured. Okay. The reason I ask is because I know that some of the other providers have been in touch with Medicaid about potentially getting, I don't know if this is an option or not, but getting uh, prospective payments to get their cash flow going. So to get payments for expected payments up front. Now, they are they're on a much different reimbursement schedule, but that may be an avenue to look at the different payers and see if there's any kind of prospective payment sources you can get. As, I mean, unfortunately with the fee for service, that tends to be problematic, but that may be an, av that's an avenue. I know some of the other provider types are looking at. You might consider that as well. Or we may, or legislators could talk to Medicaid about that. I don't know. Just I, I think that Shayla said um, some time ago that they were working with um, DIVA yeah. to try to figure out yeah. um, some funding changes here. So yeah. hopefully Med they're. No, and that, that is, they are eligible for that Medicaid program. Um, okay. And it might even be that it's not necessarily prospective payments. It might even be right. grants for some organizations. It's, it's not a uniform system, I guess. So um, definitely worth it for folks to apply to it. And true, my other, thank you, Chayla. And my other suggestion would be there's a potential for a COVID-3, another uh, federal bill. I call them COVID-1, COVID-2, COVID-3. There may be another COVID-4. And I would highly recommend reaching out to Leahy's office about um, oh, yeah. when they've been talking about the different providers, we, they've been hearing from FQHC and mental health and substance abuse. Maybe they haven't heard from emergency responders. And it may be worth reaching out to your congressional delegation and saying, hey, we're on the front lines and we're not getting any money. And, you know, Leahy is the second ranking member on the Senate Appropriations Committee. So that might be another avenue to sort of get potential future federal dollars. Just a thought. Anthony? Uh, well, I don't have any particular words of wisdom. I find myself a little more frustrated by this conversation than I usually am by the conversations we have, only because it seems like there's a crisis going on inside the pandemic that is sort of low key. And I don't know if people are meaning people outside this group that's talking about it are really aware of how dire the situation is. I think what you said before, Jeanette, about having sort of one sort of plan in a sense that brings everybody together and lists what the needs are is really important. But then there's a part of me that's not, and maybe this is just me. I'm not even sure who we would send that to. I mean, we talk about legislative leaders you know, responding, but there has to be, well, who in the administration is supposed to be responding to EMTs? I'm not. I'm just not sure, and I could be just, maybe I'm just missing it, but I mean, I, I hear Department of Health, I hear, I hear financial regulation. I just don't know, like if we had this letter that said, this is a dire situation, here's what's needed now. And, and even going back to what Nolan said, I think the federal stuff is, is good to think about, but 
it's not going to happen anytime soon, I don't think. So my question is, would we should we find a way to put something together into, let's say, a letter, for lack of a better way of putting it, that we put out to sound the alarm? And then the second part of that is like, who would we send it to? Who would we send it to? Who's in charge? Is is there anybody an answer to that? Right. Well, I I've, I have to say that I was very um, surprised when I don't know if it was Drew or Jim that said that um, much of the stuff that they had, or maybe it was even Sheila, that stuff that they had been sending up to. Department of Health had not gotten yet to Dan Basty. And, and I find that that a little disturbing because he's the person that runs the EMS office. Am I right in the, and so he, of all people, it seems to me should be on top of and aware. So I'm, I'm a little um, concerned that he hasn't Senator, been getting the, yes. Senator. I don't know. I mean, I have been talking to him about all these conversations and he's been fully up to date on that. Um, he is the incident commander for the entire COVID response. Um, so like, for example, when I get off this call with you all, I my job in the health operations center is to call positive cases and contact trace. So we're all doing jobs yeah. that are not our own. Um, so I think there's two pieces there. I, I wanna make sure that we're not sort of leaping to conclusions about what everybody does or doesn't know because I don't have that information and I and I'm I'm just a little wary of that um and then also I just want to be clear that um you know he is the incident commander here for our whole response yeah. so I think those are those are two things the other piece is that um you know one one thing that's interesting here and we kind of run into it sometimes in education is this whole local control, everything's different depending on where you are situation, which is how EMS is set up in the state. Um, and that's not something that we can change this minute. Um, some places there, like we were just talking about, they're nonprofits, they're for-profits, they're towns, they're run by the town, they're run by this, they're run by that. They're, they're very different, they're different sizes, mm -hmm. there are different needs, there are different issues, there's different leadership. Um, so it's, a, it's not a, a uniform system in that way. The health department oversees the ambulance licensing and the EMS licensing. So we license the individuals and the, and the vehicles, right? Um, but sort of how those organizations are set up and run is a very grassroots locally, you know, that's, that's a local thing. The different, the problem with that, I mean, the beauty of that is it's Vermont and that's how we've done it. And, and it's, and it's been, you know, it has worked as we've been talking about for a while now, it's not necessarily working in this moment. Um, and I think that the other part of this that's hard is for all providers, not just EMS, all of their funding is so varied. And that's going to be true again with this response. Is it FEMA? Is it the you know 1.25 billion whatever you know where is that coming from i think that the role of sort of the um the role that i can pl try to play is try to ensure that drew gets the information on what is available and can distribute that information out to everyone, but it's still going to be incumbent on those individual agencies um, in mm -hmm. some way to act on, on those opportunities. Um, and that's not perfect. And, um, and I think long-term, you know, that is a good conversation to have because that's what we've seen, you know, when we're talking about the training grants and who gets the money for training you know, we've seen that issue come up mm -hmm. there basically where there's right. this opportunity to apply for funding and some places have like a HR system and a grant application process and some places have one person who, you know, uses the computer on Sundays at the library. So I think, <laughs> you know, I think that there's so many moving pieces here, but I guess I'm, um, I'm committing to you to play the role of ensuring that um, the EMS Advisory Council Chair, you know, Drew gets the information in terms of what opportunities are existing now. So 
maybe maybe it would be helpful to um i i'm feeling a little frustrated like just like anthony is here um so at, at, at all oh, i'm sure everybody out there and and i i we need to address the the kind of crisis of this crisis within the crisis as anthony described it but we don't want to, it to um I guess we don't, in terms of who we would inform that this crisis is happening, I, I was thinking, do we inform the public? No, I. we don't want to scare people. I mean, we don't want people to go into a panic because they think that we're not going to have them because there's nothing that the guy on the street out there can do except panic. So we don't want that to happen, I think. Um, I'm not sure I, if everybody- I, I agree. I, nope. I think this is an internal thing we need to solve without it. So I wondered if it would be helpful at all to know like how many of the ambulance services are municipally based and could possibly um, apply for FEMA money. Um, and that won't help them immediately, but if we can if, if we know that they might get reimbursement, there might be some immediate money that could come. And how many are not private nonprofits and what the different needs are for them and where they would apply. And um, so we also have had in the budget, in the budget that we were going to pass, we had $475,000 from the and I don't remember the name of the fund. It's the firefighters fund, and you guys get about two percent of it. It was EMS special fund. EMS special fund. Yeah, money comes out of the fire safety into the EMS. Yeah. Special fund. And so, would that, if we were uh, somehow able to release that four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars at least, would that begin to help? I mean, it's supposed to be for training, but. Maybe we need it for other things right now also. Or I don't even know if we can do that. Right. <laughs> and, and that'll be a long way off. I mean, through the end of the session. And it may not be enough. Well, it, it definitely won't be enough. <laughs> would EMS only, Nolan, would EMS only get the 2% of that amount? No, they, 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 we had $470,000 or something in the budget or in, that, in the EMS bill. So that money is available specifically. That is the 2%. Well, oh, that is the 2%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Sorry. but that's still in a proposed bill that yeah. hasn't, that hasn't even made it through the Senate yet. By no, I know. But Jane is asking where, what, what kinds of money are needed and when they're needed. Right. So I'm trying to, Drew. So there's a, another, the 2% number comes from the, um, is a federal grant, which is the AFG grant, which is oh, not that's... Your finish, um, personal protective equipment. And out of that uh, federal bucket, which is a hundred million, um, EMS is uh, generally allowed only 2% of that. We have reached out to our congressional delegation to ask them to, to make a change in that program so that EMS is eligible for more than than uh, two percent, but that's the program that uh, you're speaking of. That that is what I was referring to. That I I got them mixed up. So how much does that two percent amount to? And is that federal money available right now? So that federal grant program is available right now. So it'd be the way it's currently written. It'd be two percent of a hundred million, uh, but that's nationwide for EMS. Oh, it's nationwide. Correct. So, so that's the current you're, chunk you're of money. You're probably going to get bill. about $7. <laughs> yeah. If we fill out the 45 page application. Okay. That's terrible. So it's a, a hundred million nationwide. And this is for equipment, right? Uh, PPE. For PPE equipment. Yeah. Like Scotty packs and things like that. Yeah, this particular uh, 
um, allocation was out of the CARES money and it was for, um, for the N95s and uh, gowns and stuff. But again, it's one of those um, grant programs that there's such a small amount of money available to non-affiliated EMS that it's not really worth filling out the application. So how do we solve the, um, or how, is there any way we can think about solving the issue? I know Shayla's working with Diva, but the, the fact that um, EMS only gets paid for transport, they don't get paid for calls. Their call volume is way down. So when they are, when they do their billing for, correct me if I'm wrong here, but when you do your billing for what you've been doing in the last little while here, it's going to go way, your billing is going to go way down. So your reimbursement is going to go way down. But that's at the very time when we're going to have be at the peak of, the, and you're going to need to be able to make more calls and have more personnel. So how do we, is there any way we can think of that we can solve this dilemma right now for that, for that period of time from at from now until the end of April, it seems to me that that's the time we're talking about that we really have to gear up and provide funding. Is that? Well, and unless Nolan can identify uh, a source within the CARES Act medical umbrella of money, that EMS qualifies for, that's a very short time frame to roll out funding. Yeah. Unless well, the, they other, all... the other issue is that like, again, the, the low volumes is the same conversation that uh, we're having in healthcare on yeah, hospitals yeah. and, and there are, everyone's mm -hmm. seeing their revenues down, but they're also like waiting for, it's like the, the, the drop before the spike into the drop again. And so I, I mean, they're obviously, I don't know how to answer that question. And then, then they're getting direct dollars through the CARES Act to help them keep their doors open. Um, again, I feel like from the CARES Act, the, only, the immediate avenue that I can think of is the money that goes out is, is somehow through that 1.25 billion, somehow ensuring that some of that money makes it into, um, you know, yeah. this, this falls into that whole area preparedness you know I, I don't know how but i don't know how you again this depends on how it's administered through the administration so who would brian well i just read uh, teresa's uh, from joint fiscal her uh, explanation of the uh some of that money isn't even going to get to vermont till almost the end of april and then yeah. it's going to have to get rerouted you know through the state agency so you're really looking at may before anybody would get any, any actual money. So we haven't passed an appropriations bill yet either. And so I don't know, I guess you could let Senator Kitchell know about the need here, but I'm not sure what we can do about actually moving money from one place to another. And I'm sensing the same frustration. Yeah, it's pretty frustrating. The, in in some ways, the quickest money that may be rolled out are for the larger EMS organizations that are set up as uh, nonprofit businesses that could, in fact, apply immediately for the PPP money, the pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Program. And uh, th mm -hmm. that would be, you know, they'd have to promise they'd re keep everybody on and pay them and then that loan gets forgiven and becomes a grant if they can accomplish everything they promised but that is the money that will they'll see the fastest i mean from what i'm hearing either that or nolan magically with everybody else figuring out what kind what what in the medical umbrella world could be applied to uh, ems well, but, but also the Steva money. I mean, I know it's not, again, it's not everything, but it is, it is an immediate source and it is available now. And, and how, and that they would go with you, through you, Shayla, for that? No, nope. through Corey. Nope, through Diva. I sent that link um, and they would, they would apply through on the Diva page. There's a FAQ and instructions. 
So, and, the, and there's the challenge with they're not speaking with one voice. So all 80 independent EMS squads has, have to apply separately. Yep, that will be true for all of this different funding. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's how they bill now. Um, so that, yes, th that's sort of what I was addressing as the broader issue that I don't think we can solve in the in this moment, which is that it is that every town almost does it differently. So one of the things that um, just popped into my head was, when, Shayla, when you were talking about the difference in the I mean, some places have development people and um, a manager that can apply for grants and stuff. And some people have to use the library on Sundays. Is there, there used to be a program called SCORE, the Senior Corps of, reti of oh, Retired yes. Executives. And I, I was just thinking that a, a really wonderful, um, kind of volunteer service that could happen by retired executives or retired um, grant writers or just retired people who want to help is to help those smaller um, organizations apply for that money because it's going to be very, very difficult for probably um, 70 or 60 of them to apply because they're small. Does that make any sense? And could we um, somehow get that out through that um, thing that Chris Campany was talking about earlier to people to uh, volunteer for their, does that make any sense? It, that makes great sense. SCORE was on one of our small business calls that where we did the four chambers on our business call and they're terrific and they stand ready to help. So. Uh, there are score representatives for different areas. Um, and I uh, know the one from, it's upstairs, but I have the name of the one for our, for the Upper Valley, but they are ready to rock and roll with which whatever companies, nonprofits, anybody that needs their assistance. Maybe That's we a could great get, idea. Maybe we could get a list of score uh, contacts in the different areas and send it to Drew and Jim and they could get it out to their, um, the people in their, on their mailing list to the ambulance services. I, I don't know if it would help or not, but um, oh, it couldn't hurt. They're great mentors and they could work with each one of those independent entities. Drew? So, um, you know, the program that Shelly was talking about is a, um, Kind of an example of one of the challenges that ambulance services are, are facing. Um, so that program has been out for um, I think a, a week now. Uh, the first we learned of that was nine. Um, so you know as far as you know our ability to kind of be part of the healthcare system and kind of manage the crisis of the healthcare system, uh, we're not getting um, any of this information. And you know, I read through dozens and dozens of emails every day. But you know, when I got that uh, information from uh, Dan last night, you know, one of the first things I saw was the date that it came out and the uh, notice that it's on a first come, first served basis, and that we're already a week behind um, the, the curve. So um, services don't know at this point. You know, we'll be sending that information out. Um, so that they can, you know, start applying for that. But that again was news to us um, as of, of last night. And I'm not sure how we get included in, you know, healthcare, um, but we seem to be missing out on um, a lot of the discussions and certainly some of the solutions that are coming out of um, the, the COVID response. So I would suggest maybe that um, you should, somebody should um, join every single healthcare committee meeting. And I know that's asking a lot of, again, but um, I think that they um, are probably one of the first to hear besides um, the Department of Health and the administration. Um, Am I right about that, Nolan, or not? 
I don't know. Who who was the first to hear? I don't know. Sounds like but, you need a lobbyist. <laughs> no, but I mean, this is not, I, I, this is Shayla. So, I mean, I just learned of that, uh, Drew, when I asked about, you know, if there was anything that was happening right now that, that EMS could tap into. Um, I think one of the pieces of, that's happening right now is that in response to COVID, things are changing daily. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's some sort of systematic oversight in terms of that specific piece. I think that's just a things are changing daily. I also don't think that because it was last week, there's no more money. I think that that my sense from the person I spoke to at Diva was people should apply, there is funding. Um, so, you know, that doesn't, I, I love the score idea, um, you know, because again, I think that the system that we have, we have to work with the system that we have and the system that we have is, this varied system that is dispersed across the state. And again, you know, I'm committed to trying to, to put together as many resources and communicate as many resources as I can to Drew. Um, but, I, you know, I, I don't, and I don't want it to seem like, I think that maybe overstating it to say that they're being excluded specifically, mm -hmm. it's more that it's just moving really fast. As Nolan said, there isn't clarity right now how that money, the you know, the CARE Act money is going to be. It's not. It's it's just such a moving target at, in this moment. Yeah, I don't want to, and I don't want to um, downplay how frustrating that is because I I, it is very frustrating. It's not that I'm not suggesting it's not frustrating. I just don't think it is um, intentional. Yeah, yeah. I, I must. Oh, no, I was gonna follow up and just be like, I don't, and I like Shayla said, like I don't know what the protocols are or how the money is going to be distributed, like well, how the administration is going to distribute that money, and or what the or and we haven't determined what the legislative role is going to be. And sort right. of have some guidance in that. I don't think it's been. It's all still up in the air. Who determines what the legislative role is going to be? Well, I mean, I think the legislature is trying to figure out what the legislative role is going to be. <laughs> and well, here we that, are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but, you know, yeah. the money's going to come in and then, like, it's going to go out and who decides what? And I think that's, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, now, the Corey, Corey Gustafson's let, it, it sent us an email about diva money. Uh, I feel like in the last day or so. Did did you all get that? Yeah. I yeah. don't think so. I remember seeing it. Yeah. You do? Yeah. We And I'm just trying to find it to forward to Gail to send out and just to see if it had anything useful in it for Drew. And I, I can't find it. It's my iPad isn't finding it. Maybe if it, you're on a, a laptop of... Uh, Brian, maybe if you could find that, if you it, maybe that if we could send that to Gail to send to Drew or send it straight to Drew. I'll look for it right now. It came out, I believe, on Saturday, Sunday or Monday. I haven't had anything from Corey since January twenty sixth. Well, Corey may not have sent it out directly. He may have given it to somebody else to send it out on his behalf. So it might not be in your mailbox oh. from Corey. It might be oh, from okay. Janet or Teresa or Peter I or see. whoever. Okay. Okay, so if we can find that. So where- I have it here if you want. I can just read it if this is what we're talking about. It was sent out yesterday at 10.30 from Peter Sterling. Oh. Um, Vermont General Assembly, there was a commentary published in VT Digger that may have produced questions regarding Vermont's Medicaid actions. I'm sending you a document that provides a side-by-side -side comparison, and it's from Corey Gustafson. That's it. Okay, okay that's it. So okay. it's from Peter Sterling, and oh, okay. it was sent yesterday at 10.30 in the morning to everyone in the Senate. Okay. And it was, it was in response to an article about what Diva was and wasn't doing. Yes. Oh, okay. But... Uh, and I just, I couldn't remember. I sort of quickly looked through it. I can't remember if it had um, funding things, but it, it, 
it might be helpful for Drew to at least see. Okay, so as far as I can tell, I'm not sure where we are, but I think that we have some things that we are going to do. And um, the EMS Advisory Council should send a letter to Leahy. I think our committee also could send a letter um, talking about the dire circumstances and the fact that they need to be in. That's not gonna be immediate money, but we're gonna need money afterwards also. So is that is that a step that we should take? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You should send it to all three congressional members. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll send that letter. Um, we I would suggest that the EMS Advisory Council also send a letter saying the same thing. Okay. Um, we are going to um <laughs> what else are we going to actions can we actually you know, Shayla is going to continue you, to work Shayla, with Viva. You could yeah, you Shayla. could also you could also do a letter similar letter to Mike Smith or the governor flagging yeah, this. I think, I think we should do that. I think yes, okay. I think, no, that's I think the governor has been doing a fine job. I'm not being critical or anything of what the governor's been doing. I think the state's been operating pretty well given the situation. But this just seems like something that's fallen between the cracks. And I think it's worth it for us to point that out. We could do it in a way that's not, you know, it's not confrontational. No, no, no. Political. It's just we really want people to know that this is happening. And I think um, Jim Harrison had, he was on our call um, with the Wyndham County delegation. And he was also going to contact uh, Secretary Smith. He's has a good relationship with him and has known him for a long time. And he was also going to, but we could send, also send the official letter. I, I think that would be helpful. And Shayla, you're kindly gonna work with Drew on the Diva connection. Um, I, I wasn't gonna work with Drew on the Diva connection. I, I was just going to continue to funnel information when mm -hmm. it is available on funding and how to apply for it from various yeah. sources. But, and, and so there, there is something that's been identified already and that Drew could access. Yes. And, and I will um, find out who the, uh, I'll get a, a, a score contact for everybody in, for, in every area of the state and send that to Drew and you can get that sent out to your your people if that's helpful not just um score but there's also aarp yep. uh, volunteers yeah but score brian, is real well organized by region i think right brian uh, you might get uh you might get um drew the 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 score person for the whole state and then each individual ems for their area could be in touch to get yeah that's what i'm going to do yeah that so would that be drew great. doesn't have he's got enough to do i'll find out who they are Brian. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, even though it's down the road a little piece here, I think we should continue to let Senator Kitchell know of our uh, desire to find some money and funding for the EMS uh, with regard to, uh, you know, the appropriations bill, the, bu the budget. I, I know we, we're not going to deal with that right away, but we will have to deal with that before we adjourn. So. I, I yeah, just oh, think it, it's crucial yeah. to have her still understand the uh, the need here. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else that we can do right away? Not really. All right. Um, but. So I, um, we might, we might want to um, send a, a letter to um, the health and welfare committee and also to our Senate leadership talking about the importance of making sure that the, our EMS services are 
included in the in the distribution of the CARES money, if if we have anything to to say about that. I mean, we'll send the letter to Mike Smith and the governor, but I think we should also send it to our own leadership so that they know, because I think Anthony is right that there, except for the people that are here, a lot of people don't don't know that this is um, an emergency. Chris, Campany. This is a question, I guess, primarily for Drew and Jim. I don't know you, but feel free to jump in here. Um, is is there any is there like a, a association of Vermont EMSs that's that's serving as like a conduit of information from agencies up and down for you guys? Drew. Uh, yeah, Vermont has a uh, uh, ambulance association that is uh, working. So Jim actually is the president of uh, that association. And, and as part of that, I help work on the legislative components. Because what I'm, what I'm trying to figure out, and uh, Sheriff Mark Anderson called me earlier today asking about uh, FEMA funding. And I referred him to our staff person who uh, has a lead on that. But what I'm trying to figure out is um, on, on Fridays, uh, Vermont Emergency Management has calls organized with uh, Department of Health and other agencies uh, to communicate with regional commissions, emergency management directors, and town officials. Is anything like that happening for EMS services that you're aware of? I saw Drew shaking his head. Jim, is there anything that you're aware of like that? Like there's calls every week that we have with the chiefs of EMS, fire, and police all at the same time every week on, I believe it's Wednesday. With the agencies? Yeah, the, with the the commissioner and uh, okay. Dan Bates, okay. the Department of Health, and gives the updates. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Anything else that we can do. Did we lose uh, Senator Bray? No, he's here. Oh, I had I had to scroll to see you. OK. Um, OK, anything else that we really that we could tackle today? Can we? Um, I know that it's uh, maybe we can have some kind of an uh, well, Friday, there wouldn't be much of an update, would there? Is this Tuesday? Yeah. But if, if, if things, if people have ideas of things that we might be able to do or be helpful with or have an impact on, please send them to, the, to us as soon as possible because um, it might not be legislation that's needed, but maybe just um, some pressure from us. So if anybody has ideas or anything, let us know. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think the, the head of score for Vermont is Denise Duquette is my vague memory. Uh, and I'm just, look, I'm just looking her up for you and I'll try and get that. Um, it's okay. I think I know the score guy down here. Oh, okay. But um, we'll find it. If you find that, let me know. Um, the other thing that uh, you guys should contact uh, local colleges, and if you need help with contacts for the local co for colleges in terms of um, supplies, let us know, and I bet we can get you some contact information from our different areas. Chris Bray represents. Um, the area for Middlebury. Um, I have Landmark College and uh, Marlborough College and World Learning, all three. Um, Anthony has, do you have some colleges there? Yeah, Fine Arts, College yeah. of Fine Arts. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So if you- Goddard. Goddard. Goddard's being taken Goddard. over at the third location. Right, Ooh. right. They're not gonna give anything up there. Um, going to be housing people who are sick. 
So, um, but if anybody has, if you need any contacts, let us know and I bet we can find some contacts for you in terms of um, maybe getting, um, Rutland, you have- uh, Castleton. Castleton. Yeah. The other two closed, unfortunately. Hmm? The other, There's oh, yeah. two that have closed, unfortunately. Well, maybe they have some supplies in their closets. <laughs> Perhaps. Hmm? Senator, I have to take off and go to another Zoom. I'm sorry. Thank you, you for being with us, Nolan. It's been great, Nolan. Bye, Wish Nolan. I could be more open. Senator, Next time I have bring to go money. to. I have to go to, but please be in okay. touch via email if you need anything else from me. We Thank will, you. Mila. Thank you so much. And we realize that you're all doing about 10 jobs, so. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to defend yeah. Dan. He's doing no, an no. job. And it was not meant as a criticism. No, I know. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Um, anybody else have anything? Chris Campany, you are going to send that to Gail and she can distribute that about the volunteer things. I already did. You already did. Okay. And um, anything else? Yeah, I, I, I've just got the score one contact. They sent in looking at their website, it looks mostly organized around less around regions, but more about specific areas you need mentoring in. So uh, anyway, I've got their phone number for you. If you, okay. if you want to call them, I'll, I'll text it. You, I'll email it to you after this. Email, you know I can't text. I know, I just took it back. Yep. <laughs> um, anybody else? So, so I, don't, I don't think at this point there's anything legislatively that we need to do. I will work on um, a letter, those two, two letters to those two different groups of people Secretary Smith and the governor, and then a letter to the federal delegation. And that sounds um, good. Send it to people and you can look at it and see if it makes sense and we'll send that off. I'll try and get that done today, Drew. So um, at this point, um, I, would, I greatly appreciate what you've done. Um, and from our conversation on Sunday until now, I think just the, the questions that you've raised and the invitations that you've put out to um, to the department as well as um, kind of getting us some uh, answers around the National Guard have been um, super helpful. And I think we're, we're moving forward more uh, because of your conversation and your interest in helping EMS. So I greatly appreciate you guys taking the time to, to work on this. I know there's uh, a lot of people looking for uh, funding and you know you guys are going to have a, a tough time trying to figure out how to sort through that. Um, I will certainly send out all the information to services and um, continue to communicate with the health department and I'll send you uh, updates as we kind of hear from services and what their struggles are um, and I think it's going to be a, a challenging few weeks for for services that we kind of hit the peak of the pandemic. Um, if there's anything else I can be of assistance with, please let me know. I, I have one suggestion. I don't know if, I know that it was very helpful on Sunday for you to set up a meeting with the Wyndham County delegation. And I, I would suggest that if, if you have somebody who can do that in the different counties or the different, um, EMS districts somehow with the delegations from those that that would be, it would be important so that those people also are aware because on our call, it was clear that even, even people from our delegation, many of them just weren't aware of how drastic the, the problem is. So if, if there's any possibility, I mean, do the rest of you senators think that that might be some kind of a, to, to, so that your, your county delegations can actually hear some of the same things that we're hearing? Or do you not have county delegation meetings? We don't have them outside of the state house where we haven't had them so much. Um, yeah, we almost never have them. We, we've been having them every Saturday at one. Yeah. And, then, and then we had this, um, emergency one with rescue on Sunday. Fabulous. 
you might want to organize your county delegations. Uh, Zach Ralph is organizing our county delegation and I will put this to him. It's, it's oh. hard to find the time, but we have been doing it every Saturday at one o'clock. Who organizes yours? Um, well, we, we meet regularly during the session also every other Thursday morning. And um, so John Gannon is our chair right now. We have a, um, it usually falls to the new person, <laughs> but John Gannon is our chair right now. And so he just does it. Right, but he's that kind of a person, that, which is great. You're lucky you found a person that does that. I mean, the Rutland delegation is very active during the session, but Brian, have you been meeting in out of session? No. Yeah. And the Windsor County may be the least active delegation, and uh, we gather usually once a month, uh, but we have not done out of session. And Washington County, do you ever gather? Once. Yeah, that's what I know. It was sometime last year. I forget when. <laughs> yeah, I had that feeling that you're even worse than we are. So um, it's a good it's a good idea, Jeanette. Um, I'll mention it to Butch Shaw. He's our chair. Yeah, and I'll mention it to Zach Ralph. It just, it's um, mainly what we address is issues that are particularly relevant to Wyndham County. And there are some issues that right. are very important to Wyndham County that also affect others. And that's why, since Drew is the, uh, I think, are you the pres president of the EMS Advisory Council or some such thing? that he reached out to us and um but it's it's very helpful for us to keep in touch with each other and know what each other are doing so chris did you want to say something chris bray uh, well so in addison county we have these legislative breakfasts a dozen of them all session long but they have been canceled so because we generally saw each other every monday morning for 12 weeks in a row more or less um, yeah, we, we use that. But now uh, you're reminding me that we've lost that connection. Yeah, and ours are, we invite people to come like Chris Campany came and talked to us once. Sometimes it's on the phone, sometimes it's not. Um, yeah. But we oh. invited different people to address us on issues relevant yeah. to Wynd Wyndham County. So right. And that's it, what it, we just did too. Um, but you're, you're, we have, uh, but your breakfasts are in different communities, right, Chris? I mean, you travel around the county. Going yeah, we're, to we're like a vaudeville act. Right. <laughs> so it's, it, but it's only, it, it's only for you and Ruth that it's every Monday because ev everybody else is just in there, go to their local town ones. No. no? It, it's really, no. But uh, people decide on their own. So some people travel wherever it is other people don't even come when it's in their town you never oh. <laughs> <laughs> got it <laughs> okay. and chris speaking of it as a vaudeville act i've heard that people both cheer and boo uh well, <laughs> yes well you know the the booers are more modified i mean uh motivated to show up um but no it's a very polite, friendly conversation. It gets a little tense now and then, but uh, well, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a chance for uh, citizens to show up and ask questions uh, of yeah, their yeah. legislators on anything. And it's also a, um, a chance for legislators to give a brief report out on mm -hmm. what happened in the last week, that kind of thing. So it, some people complain about them, uh, I'm sure I have more than once, but it's, it, I've been to 130 of them over the years. So oh my goodness, uh, they're actually really helpful. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, it's um, a bit of a chore to get up in the dark and drive to one on Monday morning, but um, it's really great that we do it. Uh, it's a, I think it's a worth the effort. Yeah, most of the community meetings that are set up for us, I think are worth the effort. Yeah. So is there anything else Chris Campany had to leave us um, to go to a COVID-19 meeting? <laughs>